Hello there and welcome to this systems architecture video as part of OCR J276 GCSE Computer Science. Uh, in this video we're going to be looking at different uh, parts of systems architecture and how they all really get on with each other and work. So let's get cracking. So today we are looking at the purpose of the CPU, von Neumann architecture, CPU components, the fetch decode execute cycle, characteristics of CPU performance, and also having a quick look at embedded systems. You can see there the learning outcomes for what we are pacing ourselves for and what we're challenging ourselves for today. So let's crack on with the CPU. The CPU stands for Central Processing Unit. And you can see there it's that little square looking thing which that person's putting into their uh, computer. Size wise, it's quite small, but it probably does the most important job in the computer itself. It carries out all instructions and processes, all data going on inside the CPU and also outside the CPU. So at the moment, as I'm talking what looks like to anyone else, to myself, into a microphone, what's happening is the CPU is telling the PC, right, okay, there is audio input coming in, you need to handle it, it needs to be recorded, oh look, he's streaming, it's doing so many different things all at the same time. And when we break it down, it performs particular instructions and processes millions and millions of times a second, quicker than a human brain ever could. Um, and because of that, we're able to do quite complicated things. It performs basic logic and arithmetic. And I say basic, we're looking addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, um, greater than, less than values. But by doing these things, these simple things, really quickly, really efficiently, it's amazing what we can do. And it also, as I said, mentioned briefly, um, it controls input and output coming in and then coming out of a computer. If something's happening, the CPU knows about it. So there we go. There's some questions for you. Give the video a quick pause and we'll move on. So first of all, the first CPU architecture we are going to be looking at is von Neumann architecture. And we can see it here. We have got the input device and that could be a keyboard, that could be a mouse, it could be a microphone. And what's happening is a signal is coming in and then it's being interpreted by the CPU. And then as a result, something happens on the output. So the memory could typically be the RAM or some sort of secondary memory. The control unit is in overall charge. So the control unit says what's happening, what's going on. It's in the overall control. We've got the input and output, as we talked about here. We've got the arithmetic logic unit, which does any comparisons of data, or it does any maths. And then we've got a bus, which shares and sends the information. Now, the thing is, the emphasis here is on the singular bus, because there's only one bus, one way for the information to flow around the CPU, which can result in von Neumann bottlenecks. Because we've got all this data being shared, exchanged, swapped around, if we've only got one bus, one uh, way of data being shared, because buses are used for sharing data inside a computer system, if we've only got the one bus, then obviously there's going to be delays. If you've got a whole group of people only waiting for one bus in the real world, you can see the problems that are going to arise. Exactly the same issues with a bus inside a CPU. So with this, we can see a basic setup for a central processing unit. If we're looking at CPU components more generally, first two we're going to be looking at is the MAR and the MDR. The MAR is a memory address register, MDR memory data register. And the register is one of the first places the CPU looks for information. The MAR, the address register, holds the address, holds the location of the next piece of data to be used. And you've guessed it, the MAR holds the data itself. So we can see the relationship between these two and how they work and how they operate. So the MAR holds the address for the next piece of data to be looked at. The MDR holds the data itself. We've got the control unit and the ALU. So again, as we looked at previously, the control unit is in overall charge. The ALU does all the maths. We've then got the cache. So what the cache is, the cache is a type of memory which is very, 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 very fast. When we're looking at cache memory, we'll have a look more in a little bit. We've got three levels of cache, level one, level two, level three. We'll come on to this more in a minute. But it is one of the fastest types of memory you can get alongside registers on a computer system. We've then got the program counter, which then increments 
as the CPU does its fetch decode execute cycle, which again, we'll see things in a little bit more detail later on. So we've got the MAR and MDR, and the memory address register, the memory data register. The MAR holds the address for the next instruction or the next piece of data to be found or used. The MDR holds the data itself. We've got the CU, the ALU um, being in control and doing the maths. We've got the cache being used as a storage type, as a type of memory inside there. And then finally, we've got the program counter, which does some incrementation. So what I want you to do is show me uh, different components of von Neumann and modern day CPU architecture, what the limitations of von Neumann architecture, how do registers interact with each other, uh, what features do von Neumann and modern CPU share, and why a bus is so important. If we think back to this previous CPU component slide here, we've got many, many more buses sharing information between each of the different pieces of hardware, each of the components. Why is that so important? So give the video a quick pause and we'll move on. So now we are going to look at the fetch decode execute cycle. And the way to think about this is a nice little triangle, fetch decode execute cycle. So what happens in the fetch stage is an instruction or a piece of data is, pull, is pulled from the memory and stored in the main memory. So that is referring to the cache or particularly maybe in, into the cache or then the program counter register stores in the address. So this is where the MAR, MDR comes into play. And then the program counter is incremented by one. So that all happens during the fetch cycle. When we're decoding, interprets the opcode or op functions from the MAR MDR and the data from the main memory is then put into those particular places. And then finally the execute stage, the CPU executes the instructions that are inside the MDR and the MAR. At this stage, the MAR, the memory address register, is already looking at the fetch cycle to find the next piece of information. And it commonly comes up that as an exam question for the fetch decode execute cycle, what happens during it? If you see an exam question, explain what happens during a fetch decode execute cycle. If you just write it fetches, it decodes, it executes, you're not going to get anything. You need to make sure you're happy with referring to specific pieces of hardware when you're doing this. So give the video a quick pause and then we'll carry on. So what we're going to look at now is increasing CPU performance and making them go quicker. So imagine we have got our CPU here. It is 1.2 gigahertz in speed, which means 1.2 billion cycles a second. We can increase the cores. So the core of a CPU processes all the instructions. So if we've got a one core CPU at 1.2 gigahertz, you guessed it, it gives 1.2 gigahertz of speed. If we've got a dual core at 1.2 gigahertz, it gives 2.4. If we've got a quad core, that is going to give us 4.8 gigahertz. And then we can get six core. And commonly now in phones, you can get eight core. We can see that is going to just keep increasing, keep increasing. So the more cores, the greater the clock speed, which means the more instructions can be processed. And then if we've got four cores, we can say this is the instruction, and this part is going to be done there, this part's going to be done there, that part's going to be done over there, that part's going to be done over there. So we can share the load across the cores. As I've mentioned previously, clock speed, if we're looking at our CPU of 1.2 gigahertz, when we get it, we could maybe up that up to 1.3, 1.4. And this is called overclocking. And what we're saying to the clock speed is, right, okay, then you are meant to be doing 1.3 gigahertz, 1.2 gigahertz. I want you to go to 1.3 gigahertz. The CPU will be able to do that. But as a result, it might overheat. If we think about if you're going to do push-ups, if I say do 10 push-ups at a normal space, normal pace, you'll be able to do that for, say, 30 seconds. But if I said, right, okay, I want you to do as many push-ups, maximum speed, maximum effort as possible, you're not going to be able to last those 30 seconds. So overclocking can make your CPU go faster, but it increases the temperature inside the CPU 
inside the PC because of the CPU. That can then damage the CPU bad times. The other area we can do it is increase the cache size. We looked at cache size briefly earlier. The cache is the place in the CPU where it first looks for instructions or for commonly used pieces of data. So if we've got the level one cache, which is the smallest, but the fastest, and then we've got the level three cache, which is the largest, but slowest. If we're only going to be storing, say, eight megabytes here, that's, that's not that much. But if we were going to be storing 18 megabytes here, that's even better because if we increase the cache size, the level one cache is going to increase, the level two cache is going to increase, the level three cache is going to increase. The larger the cache size, the more frequently used instructions, frequently installed, frequently used pieces of data, the better. It means that the CPU isn't spending so much time during the fetch decode execute cycle trying to find information. So what I want you to do now, show your knowledge of CPU performance, how could we improve it? Also think about how we can improve CPU without changing the CPU. How could we improve the system performance? So we could be thinking about RAM. We could be thinking about virtual memory. How would using these improve the system performance without changing the CPU? So give the video a quick pause and we'll move on. So the last area we are looking at today are embedded systems. Uh, I've got here a picture of a car and you can see um, dotted around it are different embedded systems that are in it. What is an embedded system I hear you ask? An embedded system is a system which is designed for one specific purpose. So for example if we're looking at this car there is one system in this car which is responsible for voice recognition. That is what is that system's job, that is what it's designed to do and that's its job in life. If the voice recognition embedded system breaks are we going to buy a brand new car? No, we're not, which is going to replace this voice recognition unit here. Similarly, if you think about inside a washing machine, a washing machine will have an embedded system uh, for controlling the temperature of the water coming in or uh, coming into it. So if the washing machine breaks and it is because of that, are they going to buy a whole new washing machine? No, we're just going to play, replace the embedded system. Embedded systems are easy and cheap to mass produce because they're exactly the same. They should be easy to replace physically and it then means that there is less wastage and there can be more specific things created which means they're going to be more exact. So last thing we're going to be doing today is ignoring that bit there, show your knowledge of defensive design, I don't know what that's on there for, we should be saying you, you know it, embedded systems and I want to know what embedded systems are, why are they used. I hope you enjoyed this video and I shall see you later, bye bye.